and piles and piles of black stuff laying there. Otherwise, it looks like uh, pretty widespread hills of not too much else out here. Pretty cool scenery. So we're here in eastern Utah today. Uh, we are exploring these amazing rock formations all around here. And this area is pretty remote and obviously very scenic. This area was inhabited by indigenous people for thousands of years. They lived along the green and white rivers and these cool rock formations. Maybe some of these look the same when they were here, although this one, that balanced rock there, I'm not sure how that's holding on. I'm pretty sure that's about to fall. A lot of the rocks that we see in these amazing vistas here belong to the Uinta Formation. This is a Cenozoic aged formation of primarily sedimentary rocks. If we step back in time in this region, we would see that there have been quite a bit of changes. One thing we'd notice are the differences, say, in the vegetation due to livestock grazing. Um, if we're talking around the 1800s, we would see, again, like I mentioned, the indigenous tribes that lived here. Um, the difference being that eventually the Europeans came in and pushed them around eventually onto reservation lands. The boundaries of which have changed over time and something that the indigenous people of the area are still battling for today. Fast forward just a bit to the late 1800s, and on this reservation land, some of the um, explorers, pioneers were poking around, and they came across a black substance in these layers, and they wanted it. But there was a problem. The stuff was actually found on the reservation land. Sadly, they pulled some political chicanery and they ended up revoking about 7,000 acres of the native's reservation land and that opened it up to the chance that they could mine, quote, legally. I've been finding small pieces of this black substance. It's been washing down in the washes here. And so we're gonna head up the road to see if we can find the source. Welcome back to Let's Go Geo. As usual, I'm your field guide, Heather, and today we're going on another geo adventure, this time in eastern Utah. And a lot of people think Utah is a pretty quiet state. Well, we're heading to an even quieter part of the state where we're going to explore some canyons and some remote hills and some old ghost town remnants because we're on the hunt for this black rock that a lot of people have never even heard of, but it's really important. And I'll show you why today. Let's go. Ah, Utah. Some think of it as the land of the canyons, and some think of it as the land of the Mormons or the Utes, or maybe the land of the few, because in many places it's there's not a lot of people around. But we also should think of it as geologically significant. Utah's geology is probably much more uh, diverse and interesting than most people even realize, uh, aside from the stunning canyons and colorful formations and the world-renowned national parks that are built around these formations and bring in a lot of tourists. And of course, there's the dinosaurs and the Mesozoic layers. Um, we might also forget to think about Utah's colorful mining history. It's, it's not usually the image that comes to mind when we're thinking about the more famous things like gold rushes, but Utah has actually had its own kind of mineral rushes, actually more in the range of black gold rushes. Um, Utah is a treasure trove of interesting and valuable mineral resources. Um, one thing to think about is radioactivity. There's a lot of interesting places people might know about. Yellow Cat, Moab area, Green River, and the Four Corners regions. Um, very well known for uh, radioactive mineral resources. But, uh, but there's also the black gold. We typically think of oil. Um, but there's some other black gold, we could say, and that's in the form of uh, coal. And the Utah has some nice coal seams uh, that come from ancient inland swamps. I've been talking about coal here, so there's a whole video on coal if you want to um, learn about it. Uh, but Utah also has natural gas resources and even oil, um, a lot of unconventional oil, some oil shale resources have been uh, pretty popular in these parts lately and will continue to be so. So that's something to follow. Okay. 
But it turns out there's another black substance that comes from Utah, and despite the fact that it's used pretty widespread in a lot of products, a lot of people actually have never even heard of it. It looks like this. Now, this is an oil shale, and it's not obsidian despite the way that it can look when it's broken, kind of shiny. It's also not coal. I know it really does resemble coal, but it's not. Actually, today, we're going to be exploring some parts of Utah, some old ghost town regions in eastern Utah, so we can learn more about this black substance. Turns out, it's actually gilsonite. This is gilsonite. As you can see, it's a dark black substance. It's actually a solid hydrocarbon. Gilsonite is a rock found in the asphaltite group, which includes hydrocarbon bitumens. While gilsonite can be found around the world, it's pretty popularly known in Utah. The Uinta Basin of eastern Utah hosts the world's largest deposits of gilsonite. And it's the only place where gilsonite has been economically produced in large quantities. This is one of Utah's earliest mined industrial minerals. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topics. Historically, this gilsonite mining occurred at various veins that were found in eastern Utah, uh, but the latest phase has been concentrated on one of the widest known veins, which is located around Bonanza, Utah. These gilsonite veins, which run in these northwest to southeast trending lines, are widespread across the Uinta Basin. You can find them in western Colorado and eastern Utah. This gilsonite was actually generated in the Green River Formation, also an Eocene-aged formation that is world-renowned for its fossil content and lately been eyeballed for its oil shale. It's actually generated from the mahogany oil shale zone in the Parachute Creek member of the Green River Formation. But it is now hosted in the Duchesne River, Green River, Wasatch, and the Uinta Formation. These formations are primarily tertiary aged, ranging from about 57 to 36 million years old. The veins range anywhere from less than an inch to up to 22 feet wide. So how did the gilsonite get where it is today? Well, it basically formed in two stages which are associated with the thermal maturation of that mahogany zone oil shale. First, high pressures deep in the Uinta Basin led to the expulsion of huge quantities of hot water from the oil shale rocks, which hydrofractured the overlying and underlying strata. And as a result, thick liquefied gilsonite was expelled from those oil shell beds, which forced open the existing fractures in the overlying and underlying strata. And then upon cooling, that gilsonite solidified inside the fractures. Indigenous people already knew about this black rock, but it was first discovered by European newcomers in the 1800s in Uinta County, Utah. So it was first called Uintaite. Some of the early Europeans to explore the properties of gilsonite included John Kelly, who, thinking it was coal, forged it to produce an awful smell. George Basser staked down a gilsonite outcrop, but he couldn't file a claim at the time, and when Bert Seabolt came around, he had him show him the vein and then overrode his claim. Then there was Sam Gilson, who also found the black stuff and started the gilsonite Asphalt Company, or the Gilson Asphalt Company. He said he'd pay a silver dollar if they named it after him, and they did. Hence, Gilsonite. It was Gilson and Seabold who really kick-started the Gilsonite mining industry. But remember, when they first found Gilsonite, it was on reservation land. So, they needed a way to get to it legally. They were joined by a mining law expert attorney. Then, some wealthy Park City investors, and finally, 
Anheuser-Busch? That's right. Turns out the gilsonite was awfully useful in sealing beer barrels. So Anheuser-Busch had a stake in this as well. In 1902, another 100 mining claims in the area were staked out, 25 of which were for Gilsonite. They were granted by another U.S. Congressional Act on Uinta Reservation lands. And then a Black Rock mining bonanza ensued. Literally, one of the mining towns is called Bonanza. But anyway. 95% of the world's Gilsonite is found in the Uinta Basin in Utah. The two big mining companies there include the American Gilsonite Company and the Ziegler Chemical and Mineral Company. These are the only companies that mine and process Gilsonite at their operations in southeast Uinta County. Still to this day, Gilsonite mining is labor intensive because of its unusual mode of occurrence in those narrow, down to 18 inch wide, deep vertical veins and the explosive hazards, of course, associated with Gilsonite dust. Chinese laborers were supposedly used in the small mining conditions, but the typical anti-Chinaman attitude of the time prevailed, even making its way into a district constitution. Many Greeks also worked in the Gilsonite mines. The mining of ore was, and still, is done by hand, using air-powered chipping hammers to carefully break Gilsonite while avoiding contaminating the ore with the broken wall rock since the product purity is important to customers. The broken ore then enters a vacuum tube at the bottom of the underground mine area and is airlifted to the surface where it is deposited into a bag house next to the shaft head frame and then trucked to a plant for processing. In the early days, the Gilsonite company sent ore by wagon to Price and then it was shipped around the world from there. Gilsonite was also discovered near the Colorado line in ghost towns with colorful names like Watson, Dragon, Rainbow, and Bonanza. This extraction of gilsonite led to the only railroad to enter the Uinta Basin. The Uinta Railroad was discontinued after an abandonment hearing in 1939. The main mining operation was moved to Bonanza and gilsonite was shipped by truck to Craig, Colorado. It was later transported to a refinery near Fruta, Colorado using a slurry pipeline. In 1957, a 6-inch, 72-mile-long pipeline was extended from the mines to Gilsonite, Colorado. At that point, it was converted into electrode coke and gasoline. But due to the economics of competition with petroleum, the pipeline operation was stopped in 1973, and the plant was sold. Gilsonite is used for a variety of end product and industrial applications that include paints, varnishes, inks, roofing materials, electrical and insulations, battery boxes, phonograph records, floor coverings, brake linings, caulking material, gilsolate for underground pipe insulation, high test gasoline, and metallurgic coke. And of course, we can't forget the sealing of beer barrels. But aside from its heavy use in ink and paint and as a performance additive for the foundry and asphalt industries, it turns out the oil and gas industry has found some pretty good uses for gilsonite in well drilling. It's the unique properties of gilsonite that's made it so important to the oil field drilling process. And continued booms in oil and gas development has only increased demand for gilsonite. When gilsonite is added to oil and water-based drilling fluids, it partially melts or deforms, plugging off micro-fractures in the rock and smearing the inside of the well bore to make it a tight, tough filter cake that prevents fluid loss. The dissolved gilsonite also increases drilling fluid viscosity, providing lubrication. The value of gilsonite has significantly increased from this oil field demand, and gilsonite sales to the oil field market have increased over 150% since 2009. I hope you enjoyed today's tour of this interesting black rock called, well, 
Uintite, but now Gilsonite, thanks to Sam Gilson. I'll be talking more about interesting black rocks. In fact, I already have a video up here at Let's Go Geo all about coal. So if you want to compare the properties of coal versus Gilsonite, check the video link in the description. If you enjoyed today's video and learned a lot, make sure to give this video a like. And speaking of beer, if you really enjoyed today's video, you can buy me a beer. Venmo me at Let's Go Geo dash yeah. Heather. Gilsonite. Thanks for joining me on another adventure here at Let's Go Geo. I'll have a lot more in kind of a Utah Black Rock series coming up. I also have a lot of stuff here on sedimentary rocks, the rocks you see around me. So if you wanna learn more about those, just sub and join me on the next adventure here at Let's Go Geo. If you wanna learn about all things Geo, I will see you on the next adventure. Bye. Thank you.